Uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Um, we're here to talk about the uh, vote in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, which has just taken place on uh, the banking uh, supervision rules. Um, I'll just, uh, before I pass the floor very quickly, just uh, say that today uh, the, the committee has fulfilled the commitment set about a month ago, which I think very few outside this House believed was really uh, possible. Uh, the MEPs have shown their resolve to, to work hard on a very difficult topic, but which also needs to be closed uh, quickly. Um, and I would also like to remind at this point that uh, the Parliament has been calling for much stronger banking supervision for uh, close to, well, actually more than, just more than two years now when we were already dealing with the, single, with the supervisory package which established the new uh, watchdogs uh, for the financial services. Um, Parliament had been already then uh, saying that the, the type of system we are discussing today uh, was necessary. So I'll pass the floor immediately to the rapporteurs, starting from Ms. Tyson um, and then Mr. Giegold, and then you can ask your questions. And I do it in the yep. Okay. Yes, please put your headphones on because I will uh, speak in Dutch. For those who do not understand Dutch, it is uh, better for the communication. Um, dames en heren. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. As has just been said, for a long time now, the Parliament has been calling for a serious uh, European integrated bank supervision. Before the crisis, we did this at, uh, 2000, in 2002, but the other institutions weren't listening. We kept insisting, and then during the crisis, we got the European Banking Authority, which played an important coordinating role. Sven will talk about that, but now... We have a real, we're moving towards a real coordinated integrated banking supervision and this is very important if uh, there is going to be European integration. So we think this is a historical step. I think I can use the word historical. What is bank supervision? Well, we have a sim single supervisory mechanism. So we are looking for a structural solution to bank supervision. Uh, banks cross borders, the economy cross borders, and therefore supervision must be cross border, it must be on the same scale. And secondly, another reason why this is important is that banks which get into difficulties, if they need capital, will now possibly get an opportunity to get um, capital from one of the European emergency funds, but the condition is that there is U European supervision, and so there will be European supervision, and this is an important condition for injecting capital from European funds into banks. The European Parliament has adopted the single supervisory mechanism and the uh, European Bank Authority together. These two things go together. The European Banking Authority had to be adjusted to uh, the new supervisory system. But we dealt with these things together because linking uh, it, it increases our democratic control. The supervisory control has been put on a legal basis. Before we could only give an opinion as a parliament, the Euro European Banking Authority is a regulation where there is co-decision. So immediately after this proposal was announced, we linked the two and we entered into an agreement with the European Commission and the Council saying that we want to deal with, wanted to deal with the two things as a package and that for both proposals we wanted co-decision. This means that we are now able to negotiate. We can negotiate about these two proposals, not just the EBA, but the single, single supervisory mechanism as well, which is my report. This morning, we adopted the report with a broad majority. The Parliament has shown that uh, Mission Impossible has become a mission accomplished. It was a very tough and difficult uh, 
file, but there's been excellent cooperation between the groups, and thus we got a broad majority. Now, this is the starting point for a single supervisory mechanism, and we want to organize this in a qualitative and efficient way. Also, we want a supervisory mechanism which helps the internal market to work efficiently. Three, we want an inclusive system. All credit institutions, therefore, should be covered and inclusive in the sense as well that we make it as attractive as possible for member states outside of the Eurozone because the system works around the European Central Bank. The Eurozone member states are obliged to take part in this, but the non-Eurozone countries are not obliged. However, we want to make it as attractive as possible for them to become involved, so it's an inclusive system. What is also, it's also important that we are explicit about the share of responsibilities between European and national level. We've got a proper subdivision of roles, therefore, and if uh, responsibility moves from member state level to European level, then the European Parliament wants this to be transparent and uh, there has to be proper responsibility at European level. So we've taken our decision now. I'll finish. The ECB is the hinge of all of this. It's an important option. The Commission made this proposal on the 12th of September. Why? We, su we supported that. Why? Because the European Central Bank is an institution which has a great deal of experience, which has, has access to all sorts of sources of information. It has a broad information network. Also, it's credible, and it's shown throughout the crisis that it is credible, and that has strengthened it. The choice of the ECB means that it can get off the ground quickly, because we have a big institution already which can do this. And in the Council negotiation, which is running in parallel with our work in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, we know that in the Council there is a broad support for the ECP in the decision-making process there, because this speeds the decisions up. Secondly, I said equal rights uh, for all member states who take part in the single supervisory mechanism, Eurozone countries are obliged, non-Eurozone countries are not, but they can opt in, they can sign a cooperation agreement, and if they do that, they are treated in exactly the same way as everybody else from every point of view in the supervisory board. They are treated equally. There is no difference between Eurozone countries and non-Eurozone countries who opt in. Their supervisory authorities participate and they are all treated equally. Similar rights, that means if there is a vote, if there has to be a decision in the board, all the preparatory, they are involved in all the preparatory work. And we've also said that the supervisory board was, must work in the interest of the whole of the union, the union institutions, not just certain countries or, or not just the Eurozone. It must be, work in the interest of the whole union. The responsibility of the supervisory board is to cover all banks, all in one system. The ECB has the final word for the whole, the final responsibility for the whole system. The ECB will share out responsibilities between national and European supervisory bodies, and at all times the ECB, in, in any participatory member state, will be able to reach a participating bank. F from Frankfurt. They need information. They can delegate this work in practice. There will be a sharing of responsibilities, uh, but uh, there will be discretionary uh, powers for the European Central Bank. But we believe, as legislators, that we have to have our say in the way these responsibilities are shared out, and we've made sure that at national and European level everybody works together in a workable way that, so that everybody uh, from the 6,000 banks are in contact with the centre, and it is important that we have an administrative bridge to the European Central Bank. Two more things. There is a strengthening between the monetary 
responsibility and the supervisory body we've strengthened the commission there that a lot of colleagues in this European Parliament wanted that and of course there is the democratic responsibility and transparency there is a reporting system but uh, we've amended the commission proposal so that we as a European Parliament have to agree with the people on the supervisor we have to agree on who goes onto the supervisory board we can hear them uh, in camera if necessary if it's sensitive information so there is this bridge and we have made sure that uh, members of the supervisory bodies can be heard by national parliaments it's a single supervisory mechanism ECV and national authorities so there has to be a share of responsibility and the national parliaments have to have this responsibility so that's it if you have any questions later yeah uh Okay, yeah, thank you. I'm not going to uh, move to the floor. So I will first present my report and then we take the questions together. Uh, well, um, first of all, as you know, there are two different reports, one to change uh, the EBA regulation and uh, one regulation to empower the European Central Bank to take over supervisory functions. And uh, I was at that time part of the negotiation team of the Parliament for the supervisory deal. I'm now here again. So I'm, and uh, the key point here is that uh, obviously only taking these reports together allows to build a strong European supervising mechanism. Uh, first, because the two reports are functionally connected and they are politically connected. They are functionally com connected because we still have the common market and we are proud of it. And that means if you want to operate in the common market, there must be uh, the same or at least the same quality of standards in, in trust in financial actors. We see signs of fragmentation of the banking market in, in the common market. Uh, some banks in some countries are trusted more than banks in other countries. This is the key reason why we create uh, the common supervisor, but it's also the reason why we want strong standards everywhere in the EU 27. And uh, this means that if now one part of the countries moves towards integrating closer its supervisory structure, there's still a strong interest to have uh, uh, comparable standards uh, all over the EU 27. We know how complicated the situation is that the largest uh, financial center in the EU 27 is not part uh, or will very likely not be part of the common uh, supervisor but um, still the EBA has the role to uh, uh, guarantee equal uh, conditions or nearly equal conditions so this is why <coughs> we suggested to strengthen the EBA regulation according to two large lines one line is to take some lessons uh, we learned during the last two years with the EBA, uh, in particular to ensure that they have the possibility to take out, take over stress testing operations and also insist that they get all the data in the quality they need. And we, you all know there have been problems uh, in the last uh, one or two years uh, with some countries and we reinforce the powers of EBA in this respect. Second, uh, we also reinforce the powers of EBA to uh, not only provide a common rule book, which is their core mandate, but also to complement that with a, common, with a common supervisory handbook. That means to have common standards for supervision, not only on the level of the rules they apply, but also the methodology with which they supervise. And what is now um, important for us, these rules will also be applied to the ECB. And that means that all competent authorities uh, of the, uh, in the EU 27 have to apply uh, comparable rules and standards and of supervision, which of course means that also countries have a say which uh, are not voting uh, on the governing council uh, of the ECB. Um, beyond that, uh, we insist in both reports that uh, special uh, business models 
which are based on, because they are small, localized, or not the traditional uh, uh, large-scale banking models have to be respected in the rulemaking as well as in the supervision, so there are special articles integrated. Well, politically, we know that uh, the EBA uh, has uh, basically, for many actors, also a political function at the moment, because uh, the ECB regulation can only be adopted if there uh, is a consensus in the Council uh, and uh, politically here in the Parliament, the EBA side can only be adopted if there is a consent of Parliament. So this is a natural package for everybody. In the Council, uh, the UK is mainly, but also other countries, nervous that if many countries now coordinate their supervision, this will have an inbuilt effect that they also vote uh, together in the EBA and will be able to outvote structurally the uh, non-participating countries. We understand that there is a problem for the realization of the project. Of course, it is a democratic problem to give some countries uh, special rights uh, in a common decision-making process. On the other hand, we see that in the process of introducing this system, there's a need uh, to accommodate certain fears. And therefore, uh, we suggest that the voting in IBA will be, will be changed in the following way, that uh, there will be a qualified majority uh, when it comes to all the rule-setting operations, but this, common, uh, this qualified majority has to consist of a majority of the insiders in these common supervisor and the outsiders, but there is a phase-out mechanism. That means if, uh, if there are less than five, less than five members outside uh, of the common supervisor, so basically if the common supervisor has reached the number of uh, 23 members, uh, meaning six of the non-euro members have joined into the euro system or, uh, have, and therefore have opted into the common supervisor, then this special right determines. Why? Because we think for a certain period it's acceptable that if you have comparably large uh, number of countries, like 17 to 10, there is an, a logic why you can give the 10 a special uh, right or a special safeguard. But when the number shrinks too much, there is no logic that in the end only a few countries can block a huge majority. Therefore, uh, we have introduced this phase-out mechanism. This compromise was able to reach a large consent in Parliament where we were not at the beginning, one has to say, and also the Council is struggling a lot with this, and I think we have introduced here a, a good uh, proposal with which it might be possible also in the Council to... Uh, to come to a functioning solution. Uh, well, uh, perhaps uh, uh, I stop here and uh, looking forward to questions. As expected, quite a few questions. We'll start Jim and then go there. Yeah, it's actually, it's Jim Brunston, Bloomberg News. Hi, I'm over here. Hi. Um, I've actually got a, a couple of questions, if that's okay. One, one's a broader one, really. It's, it's what are you expecting to be the main kind of sticking points and discussion points when you have the, the trilogues with, um, with member states on this, um, hopefully starting next week after the ECOFIN. Um, second question, just, just to clarify something, is it, is it the case that in today's vote the committee endorsed moving the European Banking Authority from London to Frankfurt? And uh, could I just check sort of what the, what the, if, that, if that is the case and if so what the rationale is behind that. Thanks a lot. Is that me? Yeah. Uh, as far as concerns the trilogue, uh, the agreement we made so far with the Council is that uh, they, have, they are still uh, having uh, working groups. They had one yesterday, they will have one tomorrow normally, and then they go to, uh, I mean, co repair meetings. Sorry, working group is behind us. Um, normally, we expect that on the 4th of December they will finalize their part of the task, and then we can, uh, we can start the informal trilogue. So we have, anyway, we have already some slots, so it will be uh, again 
uh, work uh, from the morning till the evening, a couple of days uh, after another, but uh, we are not afraid of working and we are happy that we can continue for a while uh, in, the, in the same way as we did since, uh, since September. Uh, Frankfurt and EBA, I leave it uh, to Sven. <laughs> Well, um, first, uh, on the discussion points, I think there's one uh, point which might be difficult uh, with the Council, and it's always the same. Uh, if you read the minutes of the Council meetings, uh, it looks a bit like a Swiss cheese. So all the member states want certain opt-outs uh, for their special uh, rules where they are frightened that they might uh, be uh, lost in harmonization efforts. Some want macro prudential tools to be national. Others want uh, certain banks to be purely supervised nationally. Others uh, do not want the Pillar 2 issues. So it's really a, a Swiss cheese. And uh, the Parliament has resisted this approach. So we basically think that uh, the ultimate responsibility for all the issues should be with one strong supervisor. So even if the national supervisor should play a certain role, they can delegate certain tasks, but uh, the ultimate responsibility is clear on the European level. And, uh, and uh, obviously, I'm sure in the Council, I expect that in order to reach a deal, they will give something for everybody, and in the end, you have, uh, again, no consistency in the common market. Uh, I must say, I think, uh, more or less nobody in the committee believes in this approach. So uh, the second is that I, we uh, suggest to introduce uh, a steering committee to the governance uh, of the ECB, and this steering committee shall consist only of people with a European mandate. This shall not have decision rights, but it should organize the work. And, uh, and this steering committee, including three independent experts with a gender diversity, I have to say, uh, just to come to some recent debates, this, uh, and also diverse uh, professional backgrounds, I guess the council will not love it most because uh, we, we saw in EBA what happens if you, in the current EBA, if you have basically only two people with a European mandate and, and, a, and a large bench of, uh, of national supervisors, you rarely get European solutions. Therefore, the Parliament wants to reinforce the number of people with a clear European head uh, in the system. So, uh, and Frankfurt, well, I must say, uh, I come from North Rhine Westphalia, so I have no particular interest uh, in Frankfurt. Uh, and uh, the uh, point is only that we, as Parliament, only come back to our original position. When we voted last time, we were already for putting the three supervisors in the same place. And that is particularly convincing when you talk about banking and uh, insurance. These are, there are strong overlaps between banking and insurance. And one of the main problems with the legal base of the ECB is that, as it stands with the current treaty, it cannot take over uh, substantive powers in, in, in insurance, which is an issue for future treaty changes, but at least for the rulemaking, one should uh, have one common actor. And uh, so this is not something against London. It's something for a strong common supervisor, uh, which needs to be at one place uh, in order to be effectively. This is also the model most member states have. So you don't have uh, in the UK the banking supervisor in London and the insurance supervisor in Leeds. So uh, it's simply uh, something totally normal to, that we want to have that in the same place. Yeah, Detlef Fechner with Börsenzeit. And I have uh, two questions, if, you, if I may, uh, Ms. Tyson. Um, how do you handle the crucial problem uh, of governance? Uh, how, how do you handle that uh, Swedes or Pitts or whoever should give their banks into the hand of an organization where in the uh, ultima ratio they are not uh, really included uh, perfectly in the last decision. So what we discuss in the, if you can give me uh, an answer for that. And the second is I don't understand. Now I see you have packaged these two things, uh, but is this a gentleman's agreement of the council that they uh, take your opinion uh, on the ECB or is this a real formal veto? Can, can you really stop uh, the ECB? Uh, uh, Regulation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, on the first, well, I, I, I shall speak. Well, on the first subject, um, 
non-Eurozone members, how will we convince them to participate in a system where they don't have voting rights at the highest level? Because that's the, that's the system. We have a single supervisory mechanism around the European Central Bank. In the Central Bank, as you know, we have two, this, um, two uh, bodies that can take decisions. It's the Executive Board and the Governing Council. Um, uh, we have to respect the treaty and the statutes of the European Central Bank, so we cannot give voting rights to representatives of non-Euro area member states in the Governing Council, Governing Council being the, 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 the organ that is uh, responsible for the final decision. But how did we solve that problem? We set equal rights for those who participate, because if they will participate in a supervisory thing where they don't have anything to say, nobody will come. So we said we want a clear separation between the monetary task and the supervisory uh, side of uh, ECB. Uh, so we, we organized the separation better than it was on beforehand. And we say clearly what is the task, the responsibility, uh, the power of this banking supervisory board. And what we did is we empowered this supervisory board and we went as far as we could go legally. And uh, this means that the supervisory board will prepare all the decisions, will in fact take all the decisions, prepare them, and when everything, when they have an agreement there, it goes to the governing council for a yes or a no. So it's a kind of a nihil opstat procedure. If the governing council is not uh, at the same line, they have problems, they have to send it back to the banking supervisory board and they, they will not... Uh, they shall not take a decision instead of this supervisory board. And that's the way why we say uh, this is like an equal treatment. Hmm? Um, so that's uh, for the way we organize it for the non-euro area members. Um, then uh, the package we made, yeah. We cannot change the treaty there. Uh, on the, the SSM, single supervisory mechanism, is built around the European Central Bank. This is on it's a little bit technical, uh, uh, Article 127, Paragraph 6 of the treaty. There is clearly said uh, it's around a European Central Bank, certain tasks, no insurances, and uh, unanimous decision in the Council and opinion of the Parliament. Hmm? On uh, Sven's uh, report, there we have 114, it's internal market, it's co-decision. But we have a political agreement, uh, so we cannot say this is really uh, cemented, we have a political agreement, and uh, normally we, we should uh, be able to expect that everybody uh, uh, will give a positive consequence to their own engagements. So we will start debate both dossiers, and if we have big problems and they don't listen to us and they say, oh yes, it was just for a joke, well, we can block the one of the parts that belongs together, and in the parliament we said they stick together. We will treat them together, so we have some negotiating power. Question over there. Uh, Manu Maler, journalist at Europolitics. If you don't mind, I will ask my question in French. Um, so the first question is concretely, how do you intend to guarantee the activities? Au sein de la BCE, est-ce que vous pourriez donner des exemples? Et euh, ma deuxième question, c'est sur les droits de vote au sein de l'autorité bancaire européenne. Si on peut revenir dessus, parce que je ne suis pas certaine d'avoir compris exactement ce, la procédure. Merci. Bon, D'accord. Euh, je vais commencer avec la deuxième question. Comment est-ce qu'on organise les votes euh, ou comment est-ce qu'on organise la, la, la façon dont ils prennent des décisions Quelle est, est la relation entre le Banking Supervisory Board et le Governing Council euh, Je connais pas les mots en français, je m'excuse. Uh, le Governing Council of the European Central, uh, de la Banque Centrale Européenne. Uh, bon, c'est organisé ainsi que uh, the Supervisory Board prépare toutes les décisions. Toutes les décisions seront préparées jusqu'à ce que, uh, uh, comme on, comme on l'organise au Conseil, un point A. La décision est prête à prendre. C'est oui ou non. On est d'accord ou on n'est pas d'accord uh, Si on n'est pas d'accord au niveau du Governing Council, dans la Banque Centrale Européenne, on renvoie le dossier au Supervisory Board euh, et celui-ci, il doit euh, modifier 
sa décision, il doit regarder de nouveau, euh, il, il doit étudier le, de nouveau la décision, disons. Hein. Donc, euh, dans le supervisory board, tous les membres sont égaux, traitement égal. Euh, ça veut dire que les, les membres participants qui ne font pas partie du zone euro ont les mêmes droits, les, la même position euh, dans ce supervisory board que ceux qui font partie de l'eurozone. Hein. Euh, chaque euh, autorité nationale a un vote. Donc, c'est chaque, uh, chaque authority, uh, one authority, one vote. And, uh, and that's the way we say it's equal treatment. Um, bon, la deuxième question, comment est-ce qu'on renforce uh, la séparation entre le monétaire et la supervision On ne peut pas le séparer uh, à 100%, naturellement, parce qu'on est dans une institution. Hein, et on est aussi uh, lié par des règles du traité. Donc, on ne peut pas dire qu'on va avoir... Deux piliers, comme nous, je pense qu'on l'avait rêvé un tout petit peu. Deux piliers, l'un c'est monétaire, l'autre c'est supervision bancaire, et puis on a un petit toit au-dessus. Ça, on ne peut pas faire parce que dans le traité et dans les statuts de la Banque centrale qui sont dans un protocole euh, euh, du traité, on dit clairement qu'il y a seulement deux, deux organes qui peuvent prendre des décisions à, euh, dans la Banque centrale européenne. C'est le Governing Council et c'est le Executive Board. Donc, on ne peut pas dire qu'on va prendre des décisions, des décisions finales dans le, dans le pilier supervision, parce que là, on doit utiliser les organes qui, sont, qui ont été créés, et de, créés dans le temps pour le, le monétaire. Hein. Euh, Est-ce que c'est un grand problème Je ne pense pas en soi, parce que, euh, de tout, en, en tout cas, le, le côté monétaire, ils sont responsables pour la stabilité. Et supervision bancaire, ça, on peut aussi considérer que, en fait, c'est un facteur très important pour garantir la stabilité financière dans le marché interne et surtout dans la zone euro. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on a fait On a dit, bon, il y avait déjà quelques, quelques lignes dans la proposition de la Commission, mais ce qu'on a, qu a fait, c'est qu'on a dit, bon, on doit avoir des, des lignes de décision séparées. Ce n'est pas la, la Banque centrale qui va préparer un peu pour le supervisory board et puis on renvoie. Non, non, on prépare de l'un côté et on prépare tout ça dans le, le pilier supervision. On a un budget, on ne peut pas demander un budget à part, mais on a dit sur les, les fils, they can ask fees, euh, donc ils peuvent demander des, des, des fils, je ne sais pas en français ce que c'est. Hein, oui. Euh, donc en ce qui concerne ça, ils doivent faire un rapport et ils sont aussi accountable, euh, ils, 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 ils sont responsables devant le Parlement européen en ce qui concerne leur politique fils. Hein. Euh, puis, on a dit que leur staff doit être séparé du pilier monétaire. Et surtout, ce qui est très important, c'est que le président du supervisory board, euh, dans la proposition de la Commission, serait quelqu'un euh, du côté monétaire, disons, quelqu'un du executive board of the, uh, from the ECB. And what we, uh, ce que nous avons dit, c'est que le président du supervisory board doit, être, doit venir d'ailleurs et euh, on, il doit être sélectionné dans une... Uh, une, une procédure ouverte et euh, c'est le Parlement européen qui doit donner son, son approbation. Des autres questions, juste, uh, we do not have interpreting now anymore, um, so it, I think probably it's better if we put the questions in English or you are fine in French as well, I both of you. I hope in French it's possible, <laughs> because my English is so bad. Uh, you, you, can, you, you can put the questions in French, yes, there, yes, there yes, will yes, be yes, no yes, doubt, but I think you're okay with that, okay. but the answers probably mm -hmm. is better in English. Any problem. Okay, uh, c'est Griselda Pastor de la Radio Espagnole Acer. Et moi, je voudrais savoir, il y avait un groupe de députés qui aurait préféré y aller plus doucement, plus lentement dans cette décision d'aujourd'hui. Mais quand même, la majorité a bien voulu que ça soit fait vite. J'aimerais savoir si vous attendez un accord dans les prochains conseils. Et dans ces cas, pourquoi est-ce que vous croyez que c'est nécessaire que le chef de gouvernement prenne la décision de juin Il avait déjà... Uh, yeah. Again, speak English for the answer yeah. Well, there were some people who said, uh, you are going too fast. But on the other hand, uh, we had decided in the econ from the beginning on that we would follow the track, in a, a fast track procedure, let me say, and work very hardly uh, because we did not want to delay. 
And why was it so important, or why is it so important not to delay? Because there is a momentum now, there is an agreement. At the European Summit in June, they said, the, the, our, our leaders, let me say, uh, I don't know uh, whether I may express myself in such a way, but European Summit anyway, they said uh, we want a supervisory mechanism and it must be in place uh, because if we, it is a condition to make it possible that the uh, European stability mechanism can inject capital directly to a bank that is in difficulties. So there can always be an urgency. Uh, at that moment, we all thought about uh, we, we, the first banks we had in mind was, of course, uh, the, the Spanish banks, because there was an urgency at that moment. Meanwhile, it seemed to be solved in another way. We will see. But anyway, there can always be an urgency. The momentum is there. Everybody wanted to go fast. And we said in the Parliament, we will take our responsibility. We believe that it is, re that it is urgent. We have always believed in such a project because we, we asked already for a European integrated supervision system uh, two years and three years ago and even ten years ago. So this is a momentum that we cannot just let pass. Because if you, if you don't stick to the momentum, then uh, it's possible that they say, oh, yes, now we have some time, three, four, five months, you never know. And finally, uh, you end up with nothing at all. So we said now it's our, t our time. We work, we work hard, and uh, we, we uh, will not be the procrastinating uh, part of the, of the procedure. Well, if I may... I was... Sorry. Yeah. And the demand for a report this morning in Econ, there was a demand. It was uh, formulated by my group, but that had to do with certain persons uh, who were not so happy with, the, with the, the, the fast track, let me say. And uh, that was a deal in the group to say, well, we, we, let the, we, we ask the vote again in Econ, but we were sure that uh, there was a big majority to continue, and that was the whole thing, so it's not uh, so important anymore. Well, I, I would like to, to add one or two points. I think if the Parliament wants to play its role ensuring consistency in the common market and uh, a solution which doesn't have too many carve-outs for national vested interests, then we had to be, from a time perspective, in the framework uh, of the decision-making in Council. Seeing the urgency, I think... Um, the possibility to, to really claim, and that refers to a question which was asked before, to really say no on the EBA side in order to have full negotiation leverage on the ECB side. That determines of this me can only be done credibly if we are uh, not letting the Council wait on a critical project. Uh, so if the Council now agrees, then it's very important that the Parliament has agreed before so that there's no excuse not to negotiate with us. So therefore, the, the fast track uh, here in the Parliament was a necessary condition in order to regain democratic control over the politics, uh, political process in the Euro crisis. And, and, and that was very important for us, and therefore we, we support it uh, to have this fast track, even if one has to say that uh, on both sides uh, there are, of course, uh, problems and uh, it means uh, you will certainly find uh, strange spelling mistakes and so on in the, in the documents. This is not normal with the linguists. So, and, and we have still the trilogue process to, uh, to get uh, some of this uh, corrected. So obviously this is all done uh, fast, but this is how the situation is. And by saying we, we do not, we should take more time, uh, you, you didn't change the situation that there's an acute banking crisis which needs an institutional response. And, uh, well, that's uh, the one uh, comment I wanted to make. And I think on the question what safeguards the outs are, I can only um, uh, insist that the stronger role for the EBA is also something which makes you more acceptable that you have no voting right on the governing council. And lastly, there's always a way for all countries to get a voting right in the governing council, and that's very simple. You join the euro. Before I, I see some people uh, uh, putting their coats on, uh, there, there is a text laying there, a so-called compromise text on, uh, on my report. 
it was uh, on the initiative of Fen, and that's fine that it's there, but it's not the last version, and it's a version with some mistakes in it was, uh, th this was while we were working continuously and sending it, uh, exchanging our, uh, our texts and so on. So there is a final version that, uh, that you should look like uh, if you give your name, if you want it. It's a compromised, uh, a compromised text, really a um, harmonized text. So it not, it's not a text with amendments. It's uh, the, how can I say, the, the, the regulation as we voted it and modified it today. So you can read it uh, very easily. But if you give your name, we will provide you with the last version, then you know exactly what has been voted today uh, in the Parliament, because there, there are some, some things that were not, uh, not totally covered as we uh, decided finally. I think there's one more question. If we can. Two more questions. I'll start at the back. Julie Tarzinska, the Polish Press Agency. Sorry if I repeat something because uh, I didn't understand everything what was in French, so maybe I will repeating myself. Uh, I would like to ask about the non-euro opt-ins. Uh, I mean, I understand that what you agreed is to give one vote to each opt-ins in the sub supervisory board. And as I understood, uh, the uh, Council of Governors will have yes or no right. And what, what, is, uh, what will be the situation when uh, the Council of Governors will use no right? Whether there are such non-Euro countries, can, for example, be empowered to reject such decision, not to implement if he, they disagree, and if it disagree and doesn't have a right in the uh, Board of Governors. And the second question, a last question, is about financial backstops because the financial backstop uh, EMS is one of the incentives to, uh, to be in the supervisory, but what about non-euro countries? Is there anything in your report about it? Thanks. Well, uh, the, the, the voting rights and the, the relationship between the European Supervisory Board and the Governing Council, they are as follow. So go, the Supervisory Board prepares everything uh, until the, the step where they just have to say, okay, do we say yes or do we say no? If the governing council is not uh, on the same line as the supervisory board, they, they will not take the decision instead of the supervisory board. They send it back and they ask a new, a new uh, preparation, let me say, a new, uh, new proposal. Huh? So it will be the supervisory board that, that can have their say again before it is uh, voted or decided in the governing council. Uh, in the supervisory board, one, uh, one uh, authority or one member state, one vote. So there they are, they are treated on equal footing. Huh? Also in steering committee, everybody is treated on same footing. That's, uh, that's very important. The uh, uh, second thing is, if somebody is not agreeing, but that's about national authorities that are in the system, for everybody, uh, Euro member state or not Euro member state, national authorities or person, persons concerned by a de decision uh, by the supervisory mechanism have a right of appeal. We created, this was not foreseen, an administrative board of appeal within the system. So that gives everybody, uh, again, a second chance, let me say, if there is time, of course. And then about the final uh, financial backstop, yeah, in this proposal, uh, nor in that of, uh, of uh, EBA, we cannot organize a financial backstop. We know that there are financial backstops for the Euro area member states. And uh, what we say here, that, well, that this is, is not what we say, this was a decision, a political decision at the European Council. They say we need European supervision on a bank before we will uh, give a go on a direct capital injection in, an, in a bank in troubles. Hmm? Uh, so you can say, yeah, so you, you, you are a helping partner when somehow or somewhere a backstop has to do his job. Uh, we added that it's also when it are other systems of backstop. So we don't have them now, but if there will be created something else, that the European uh, supervisory system can do that job too. So then not only in the euro area, but uh, that they can have looked uh, also outside. Yeah. I think it's worth adding that uh, if your banking system is comparably healthy, uh, seeing the future rules on, uh, on resolution, you will not need uh, a financial backstop. So 
Obviously, for us, it is uh, the priority as lawmakers to make sure that in the future taxpayers' money will not be used anymore to bail out banks. Uh, so uh, for the countries which have rather healthy uh, banking systems, uh, that which got a lot right in the past, and I think Poland can be quite proud of uh, its economic policy and also in this field, uh, you hopefully will not need a financial backstop. And if other countries need it, it's bad for them. But uh, So therefore, I think the incentive here for countries such as Poland to join is something else. The incentive is that at the moment in the college, very, uh, very often the, as a host supervisor, you are suffering from decisions of the home supervisor. And I think the relationship of power will change a bit uh, towards a more European approach, which uh, why when I speak to, to the authorities in Poland, and I had some contacts during the last weeks, uh, I think they see this as an improvement. And uh, that's what a, a European approach can offer. Yeah, do you have time for one last question? Thanks. Uh, from the new service, MLEX, John Riga. I would just like to ask about your intentions regarding uh, EBA power in two other areas. One is uh, Pillar 2, sorry for the jargon, and the other one is on um, you know, potential binding mediation with the ECB. Uh, I guess with uh, maybe you could just describe sort of which, which um, which things are really a matter for the supervisory handbook, which, you know, as we know, is, is more like a guideline, and which things really uh, require uh, the EBA to have the last binding authority. Thanks. Well, it's um, on the pillar two. We, we see that uh, in council there has been a lot of uh, – Differences created in the internal market, and there's a lot of, uh, and therefore, in particular, also in the CRD negotiations, we discovered that this is one of the areas where member states are the least uh, ready to really uh, move uh, a common market approach. And therefore, we want to make sure, as Parliament and clear, clear that we think that convergence is there needed. And the binding mediation, uh, the, and, uh, and basically making the ECB also listening to, e listening to EBA, uh, that, that we have to uh, distinguish. So there was a longer discussion inside of the shadows whether if there's an internal conflict in the ECB, there should be a bi the possibility of going for minding mediation. Uh, it's, it's known that I was quite open to this idea, mainly because I thought that might help convincing countries such as Sweden and Poland. But this was not... This was not supported by, I have to say, the large majority, which didn't want to weaken by another actor the ECB approach. So that's not part of the report, but it's still an idea which can, could be raised by some of the countries which are thinking to join uh, in order to correct uh, the lack of voting rights in the governing council. Uh, beyond that, what we agreed is that the ECB will be treated as any other supervisor, so that when there is a quarrel between the Bank of England and the ECB, they can, or uh, the, uh, the, uh, the FSA, they can move, they can sit together and uh, the ECBA uh, has to sort it out and there is not by definition uh, the ECB untouchable. And I, I think that's something which uh, is important for the consistency uh, of the common market and, uh, and also reassures uh, to a certain extent uh, the non-Eurozone countries inside of the ECB. But that's, again, something for you, Marianne. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? I think you seem satisfied. Okay. Thank you very much. If I may, uh, there, are, there is a new, the, the last version of the coordinated text of the ECB part, the single supervisory mechanism, is laying there. So you can take one and then you have uh, all the information. We voted this morning all the compromise amendments unchanged. It means that uh, the text as it's laying there, it's uh, the final, uh, I can I say, offer by the European Parliament to the Council.